What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This is the one and only Mino Choi. Mino Choi. Mino Choi who happened to last night at the Upper Mississippi Mash Out win a bronze, silver, gold, and claim some best of show hardware in me. So we're very lucky to have him here. And not only did he win those medals and the mead best of show. He won them underneath the Chop and Brew flag, yes, man. Chop and Brew. He brought that home for the Chop and Brew Homebrew Club. So I appreciate that, man. No problem. You're making excellent, us look excellent. good. I haven't entered a beer yet. But you're good. <laughs> I get honorary bonus points. Um, so what we're going to do in this episode, we're going to talk with Mino. He brought a beer, cider, wine slash ice wine, and a mead, all of which have won medals somewhere or another. Yep. We're just going to pick his brain for a little while about fermentation, what it takes. It's literally blowing 50 mile an hour winds outside, so it looks like a blizzard. It definitely got arctic since S yesterday. So we are in the right place, you're in the right place. Stay with us, other side of the title card, we're going to get into it. Chop for chop, brew for brew. All right, so before we learn a little bit about Mino, let's crack one of these open, man. Let's start with the beer, probably, right? Okay, yep. You think so? Let's start with the beer. Tell us what we're starting with, man. Okay, so this is a triple decocted Bavarian Hefeweizen um, that uh, I learned from a gentleman, uh, this recipe, and um, it's won quite a few awards for us, and uh, I mean, the techniques that he taught me and his philosophy on making stuff uh, have definitely carried over with me, and so this is one of my favorite all-time beers. Uh, Generally, as a brewer, when you're first starting out, like I never try to make something different every time. Um, my basic philosophy is, well, I just make the five beers that I can drink all year round. And once I was able to dial in everything on my home system or wherever I'm brewing at, then I felt like I could experiment because if you're trying something different every time and not... Uh, really getting dialed in then you never really know if you're getting good or not so let's try this and what are the five beers then that you you first started with as your base recipes for practice process well, and potential i mean for beer in general um when i was in colorado one time i tr tried this uh really weedy beer that came out of sort of like a champagne bottle and um for me, that was like the perfect beer, and so I tried for a few years just to chase that um, and try to be able to recreate uh, what it is I was tasting in Colorado. Um, I could never figure out the name or who made it, but it just became this mythical beer to me. Really? The <laughs> taste? To, yes, yes. It was Chasing creamy the and weedy and sweet. It didn't have that sour twang that uh, a lot of the lighter lower ABV Hefeweizens can have. Um, and so I just tried to chase after that. Um, you know, starting out, I mean, in homebrewing, I didn't really, uh, I wasn't really a beer guy, you know. Um, so I started out with mead and then I eventually moved on to everything else. But, uh, you know, I'll generally make like a Hefeweizen. I'll do like a hoppy Belgian. Um, I'll work on this multi-grain red. Um, I also like to do some stouts. And my staple is this Bavarian Hefeweizen because I can drink this all year round. Is this what you've brewed more than anything else over this the last two or three years? This is what I've brewed more than anything else. Like last year I entered nine contests and I won medals in every single one. A couple best of shows and qualified me for the Masters Championship of Amateur Brewing. Um, but it was nine different batches, you know, so. I of this beer? Of this beer. Wow. And so. It's, uh, you know, it's, it is classic. So what I'll do is You're getting that I'll doughy, that bready, that weedy, you're getting a bit, little bit of the lemon. Let me try to put a little yeast in it. You know, get some, cool some so. meat hefe. Put a little bit of the yeast. So what he just did there is he stirred up the yeast that had settled out during the bottling intentionally. Our first pour was not clear by any stretch of the imagination, but so now this could bring out a whole other yeah. palette. Whole when other you enter the contest, do you suggest they pour it a certain way in order uh. to get one or the other? I asked about that, you know, and um, they always say that they're serving it properly, so they are going to Ooh. slurry up a little bit of the yeast there. This is that much more doughy and clovey, now that you've brought the actual guts of the yeast into it. Yeah. This is delicious. 
you know, and the guy who taught me how to brew was like, this is good probiotics because it's brews <laughs> to other commercial brands that have been pasteurized that are basically dead yeast products like that wouldn't really want to be slurring that up into the yeah. mix, you know, but. Who is this guy? This guy. Um, <laughs> it's a funny story. I mean, his name is Ryan Clark and he was from Virginia, but we always used to call him Wheat Beer Ryan because uh, <laughs> I didn't know his name for a long time. So he was known as Wheat Beer Ryan. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, the first time I tried his beer, I was like, wow, that is amazing. So, I need to learn how to make that because I've been chasing this flavor. Okay. And that's the flavor right there. So, boom. Um, I basically paid to do 10 gallons, and then I was like, you take five, I'll take five, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. So, at least, you know, I wasn't coming after his recipe or anything like right. that. I always feel like I got to give credit where credit is due, and, you know, these somewhat try to compensate them in you know in any sort of way for teaching me the ways what do you think mm. this is delicious this is certainly one that you can drink year-round summertime specific but in the dead of winter right now with the sun out and the arctic wind blowing it tastes just fine yes yes you are uh, any as we go along each genre of fermentation i'd like to just get a real quick kind of two, three, five kind of rules of thumb of Mino. Like what is it, not even for this style particularly, but beer brewing, what are things that beginners uh, or intermediates might want to know to just skip some pain and suffering and, and just learn off your back? I mean, with like all fermentations, like uh, depending on whatever it is I'm doing, I always try to develop a method um, for what it is I'm trying to do. So if I'm brewing at home and I have this particular equipment, if I do this, 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 and this, it somewhat gives me predictable results where then I start to eliminate variables that could potentially throw a monkey wrench in my plan. So I always brew spring water, so I'll actually travel to natural springs in Wisconsin and I'll get the water because the guy who taught me how to make this beer was somewhat of a conspiracy theorist and he thought the sodium fluoride was affecting the endocrine system and he was originally from Virginia. You might be and, right. Uh, he said, I want to be as wild as I can be. And I realized that, yes, people from Milwaukee, they're like, oh, the Germans settled here for the, for the water. Well, not out of the water treatment plant. So that's He's from I mean. Milwaukee, by the way. Yes. So um, that's what I like to do. I like to get spring water and stuff like that because I never wanted to be, you know, the, the mildewy kitchen sink tap to be the culprit as to why the beer got funky on mm -hmm. me. So um, I try to use top quality ingredients in everything I do. I figure good in, good out. I always think of my parents when I'm making anything, you know, whether it be wine or this and that. And it's like, do I want them drinking something that's loaded with a ton of sulfite? So I really try to minimize the amount of chemicals that are going into everything. Um, I treat a lot of this more like cooking, you know, I'm balancing and seasoning and, and that's all I'm doing, you know. Um, you read on the internet too much. I mean, there's a lot of bad information out there. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, the more you know... I Stop mean, reading if, and start if, watching videos. Yeah, I mean, if you're too <laughs> technically minded also, like, that can also work against you. Where yeah. Sometimes you just need to go for it, you know? And in the beginning, I'm just fearless. I would just do it, you know, where it's like, I feel like if you know too much and then you're worried about oh, I didn't hit my mash temperature by one degree or whatever, then it's the end of the world, you know, where a lot of the stuff I do always generally falls into, you know, certain parameters. Like when I make meat, it's always going to be about this sweet, about this strong, about, you know, so then kind of takes the guesswork out of it. And once I develop the method, then it's, I just change the flavor, you know. And same process with beer, like whether it be, a red or a stout or whatever if I do these same steps on whatever system I'm doing and once you're dialed in I mean then you can make anything yeah so that's what it's about for me cool I don't want to rush along but in order to try to get through all four oh, sub genres let me get my beard again real quick go looking good <laughs> all right put that in my beer glass <laughs> sanitizer hard cider or a Ginger cider? Yeah, this is a ginger cider. So Tell us about this. it. So, and I tried making a bunch of different ciders, and there's purists who are always like, oh, you gotta go to these orchards and, yep. and this and that, but I find that generally- Is this like store-bought cider? Store -bought Good for you, man. Chris Smith swears juice. by the store-bought too. Yes, because you get the consistency, and I knew a, 
um, an orchard and I was like, okay, I'm gonna drop off these buckets and as soon as you press it, you know, don't put the ascorbic acid in, refrigerate it, call me right away, I'll be here within 10 minutes to, you know, pick it up and, uh, you know, after going through all of that, like the end product was marginal, you know, and getting flavor consistency it's a little more Ooh. difficult because of the terroir and other things in Mother Nature, you know, doesn't always allow for the same consistent flavor. So, so you're big on consistency, I guess. And if you brew for competitions, that's important. Yes. I mean, I always want like consistent flavor because when I talk to brewers, like they'll make a batch and they're like, oh, it was good this time, but you know, the next time it wasn't so good or whatever. So, Ooh. so this is an apple cider, hard cider with ginger, obviously. Fresh ginger. Man, it, this tastes like some kind of like dessert applesauce. This is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, the ginger went in. So, for what's your process for a cider? Um, generally, like when I'm making a cider, if I need to to speed things up, I mean, with seven seven days, seven to twelve days, it is bottled, carbonated, wow, and all of that. You know, um, so generally, what I'm doing is I'm taking. Four or five gallons of store bought juice, yep. and I just prefer Indian summer. And um, I'll always add two pounds of corn sugar, and which takes that right up to 1060 <clears> because <throat> that's my neighborhood. I mean, six no boiling points. or heating, just putting it in no and dissolving boiling. it. Yep, yep. Star sand, I mean, to sanitize everything, of course. Right. Depending if I'm going to add some flavoring like ginger or some cranberries or whatever it might be, I'll add those in the primary. Um, I always like to use Nottingham Ale Yeast, you know. Oh, really? Uh, yes, Nottingham, the Naughty. Um, this guy, Brian Luxack, uh, he made this caramel apple pie hard cider and he's using uh, the Naughty and it gives it sort of a bready note, you know. The naughty. That's, that's, that's what I like. I mean, you start using champagne yeast, it can really, I mean, it's a little bit too aggressive. It gets it bone dry. This it goes enough sub residual. zero. Yes, it literally. goes sub zero. And I mean, this definitely gives a nice, huh. slight bready note. Um, so a good option instead of black uh, back spicing after it's gone sub zero with champagne and trying to bring it back up, you just use this ale yeast that kind of never takes it that far down. Yeah, I mean, it's always like 1060 down to 1010, which is about 6.7%, you know? Yeah. And at those numbers, I mean, basically, one, you're like, dang, it's kicking in, and two, you're feeling it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> For me, it's about consumption to buzz ratio. I just don't want to drink the volume anymore, you know? I want to just have a couple good ones yeah. and just get this nice euphoric feeling, and, and that's about it. The ginger um, comes out more like in the middle and the end, which I like. Instead of just being apple from start to finish, oh, well, it becomes yeah. something else towards the second half of uh, the experience. So it goes in as you pitch the yeast, Okay, so Literally this, or this, a couple of days this is my basic technique. So I'll sanitize my 6.5 gallon bucket. I'll add five gallons of store-bought cider with, that hasn't been sorbated. I'll add two pounds of corn sugar. It always takes it right to about 10 to 60. I'll do a staggered nutrient addition. I'll add Nottingham ale yeast to it. And then um, I just took a bunch of fresh ginger on a mandolin and always be careful when using a mandolin because you can easily shred your hand on that and I just shredded a bunch of ginger and put it right there in primary. Um, I always like to keep a, like a low fermentation temperature uh, just to make it clean. And then what I'm doing is I'm agitating the bucket, you know, I'm shaking it up to drive off the gas which keeps the yeast in suspension and then um, I think you get a faster cleaner fermentation, you know. That's what I'm all about, especially with meat and wine. It's about agitating the bucket to drive off the gas. Um, mm -hmm. So much. What happens if gas doesn't get driven off? Well, I mean, for me, it's like, yeah, you can let whatever it is just sit there and do nothing to it, you know. But I'm a lot more hands-on in the beginning, okay. which means less work later on, you know, like. Or less waiting later on. I also feel, yeah, that's true too. Um, I also feel like, you know. Basically, if I'm not doing this agitating, then whatever it is I'm making is basically sitting in a dirty diaper. Ooh. Yes, it's sitting in a dirty diaper because if you were to open up one of these buckets of wine or meat or cider when it's actively fermenting and you hit it with like a drill to, to agitate it, I mean, it would just erupt. I mean, that's yeah. dissolved gases in there. So yeah. that is a waste product of CO2. The wine, the wine wand. 
Or the wine whip. You know, but like instead of using that, like the spoon. In the, in, no, no, no. In the bucket. You know, that's why I like buckets because it is a closed system. You know, like I can just shake it and there's enough voice. Oh, you just station. shake it. I just shake it. Shaking it. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. Yeah, For the I first mean, so, five days, like yeah. every other day or so. I mean, like when I'm making meat, I mean, I'll shake it 10 to 15 times a day for the first two to three weeks. Do the truffle shuffle. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Do the truffle shuffle. Oh so, God, I, I mean, yeah, but that. when I tell people that, they're like, what? I'm not doing it that way, you know? But like for me, it's, there's only one primary fermentation, I think one chance to get it right, you yep. know? And, you know, when I'm doing that with ciders and, and things like that, I mean, the primary is pretty much done in about four days. Mm -hmm. Four days and it's, it's... Just you know, a regular smack pack of Nottingham? Oh, just the, or it's, it's not dry. even dry. It's just That's dry. right. Just cut and cut and pour. S quit and sp uh, sprinkle. Yep. I'm force carbonating and then racking cane packing into bottles so I can dial in the carbonation and still have some residual sweetness. Um, you know, so what I'm doing is pretty much I'll do my primary fermentation. I'm agitating it and adding nutrients so it's done in a short amount of time. I mean, yep. three to four days, it's pretty much done. Then I'll actually just add a minimal amount of sorbate to the bucket. Um, and then just cold crash it right away. Then I'll rack off of that into a keg. Um, a lot of times when like, you're fermenting stuff, I will add like a, a can or two of frozen concentrated apple juice because no matter what you're using, your house smells like apples, but it doesn't equate to, I mean, that apple flavor is not <laughs> in the beverage anymore, you know? So you, yep. I, I do like to add a little bit of that. And then- um, When you say that, and I've heard other people say that, do you mean, the little can, yep. let it thaw back to juice from the way you buy it in the store and then just dump it. Yep. You're getting a sugar boost, you're getting a flavor boost. Yeah, yeah. I mean for me it's a it's At a what day do you do that ish? Um, Three. So after it's been sorbated and stuff like that and once I rack it to the keg, that's where all the magic happens. That's where you can really turn the cider into something different, you know, like all my ciders start out the same generally, I mean unless I'm adding things in the beginning like ginger or fruits, but um, you know, with the caramel apple pie, it's plain cider up until the kegging back sweetening portion of it, you know, and that's, that's where it all happens. And these are things that are all worthy of a whole other episode, honestly. Like, it's hard to sit here and talk about things like back sweetening and keg filling bottles. So, we're going to move on. All right. Wait, we will come back to you <laughs> off camera. Things will get real. Off camera. What is next? I feel like uh, all we have left is uh, like heavyweights. Bladows. Yes, as I they mean, say. This or is, as I um, say. what we're going to be doing. All right, we got ice wine and mead. Area of expertise. What? What? Are, where do they sit ABV wise? As far as generally, like all the meads I'm making are about eighteen to twenty-two percent alcohol by volume. How much so, is the ice wine? Uh, the ice wine is actually stronger than your average ice wine because I made it. Okay. Um, it's it's a one that'll actually get you a buzz. You know, most of them are in the nine to ten. This is I'm assuming. Oh really? 13. A lot of ice wines still keep it low. Yeah, even they, though, they do okay. keep it low. You know, where it's like you drink it and you're like, oh, oh I man. sort of have a buzz. Oh, well, this is uh, <laughs> this is a long mead. episode of two guys at a table. This is it's a, a bunch of metals. Tell me about brewing. Uh, you haven't brewed that long. I would say, speaking of buzz to um, consumption ratio, yes. your brew to metal ratio is extremely high. For, that is. I would say you've only been brewing for three years, right? Or about three fermenting and a half years. for three yeah, years. About three and a half years. Um, That's ridiculous. Three and a half years. Um, and how many metals in three and a half years? <sighs> At least 60 some. A uh, bunch of best in shows, a lot of trophies and plaques and, and things yeah. like that, and multiple winnings. Like now, it's um, I'm repeating winning contests back to back. So this is actually the official Jade Green Girl Scout sash, but I was too fat, so I had to extend it with the Korea Red Devils logo because this is made for like a 90 pound girl, and so this means I'm a supporter of the Korean national soccer team. And basically, this is only the most heavy-duty hardware you can get in the country. I chose this just to be funny, but I'm comfortable with myself. So, and but, but, then, <laughs> but then when there's ladies who see this color, they instantly know what it is, and I like that. It's awesome. But there's too much hardware. This is about 8.75 pounds now with all the hardware on there. So what I'm gonna do is try to make either like a fishing vest style no. something where it evenly distributes the weight that's where it's at and this is the pride and joy right here bam let's see if we can see it see it say dg double, double gold. gold yes 
Lalamont Crystal Trophy Amateur Wine of the Year. I mean, that's it. And the mash out, because there are five national champion mead makers there. I mean, to me, that is as good as it gets, you know. So do you brew necessarily or ferment for the contest, or are you truly fermenting? Okay, this is the wrong way to ask the question. Does the metal mean a metal, or does the metal just mean you've got it? And after getting the metal for X amount of times, you're like, this is so dialed in, now it's ready, possibly for commercial production, possibly for whatever. I've always wondered about people that brew for competitions, because I don't. Do they just love shiny things on their wall, or is it a more of a sense of building up to a career? Well, I mean, this, is, this has opened some doors for me, so... um yeah, I mean, it has opened a dream job for me. Okay. But uh, Are you basically, to talk about it or do we skip past that? I mean, we can get into that a little bit. Um, but, uh, I mean, for me, it's like, it's other people's enjoyment, you know, of my stuff. Like, I make things all the time and people are like, oh, you must drink all the time. I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't. I actually never taste any of my stuff unless I'm sharing it with somebody, you know? Because I mean, you, you have cook, that much confidence that it's good. You cook a fantastic just, meal. Yeah. You know, if you eat it by yourself, it's nothing. You know. But for me, it's other people's enjoyment. You know, people are like, oh, you must be drinking all the time. No, I never drink any of my stuff unless I'm sharing it with people. So this was a great opportunity for me to enjoy like, my stuff. To drink this stuff. You know, I'll actually, um, I'm dialed in on my processes, so maybe um, I will taste some that's left in the siphon tube, mm -hmm. you know, but other than that, I mean, I don't, I don't even taste anything anymore. It's just when it's done, I'll give it a small sample and that is pretty much it. So what do you drink at home? Oh, you don't, don't drink that no, much. I don't, I don't drink at home, really. Tell us about this, man. We're rambling. Okay, so this is a super <laughs> it's got legs. It's like super slick legs, man. It is. It is. And it has won multiple best of shows. I've placed at the Mazer Cup and, and some other competitions. Do you call it anything in particular? It's Superberry 2.5. Oh, is that what you just said? Yes. Superberry 2.5. Superberry 2.5. So We tasted this beforehand, and it's, it's so rich and jammy. It's, uh, it's not as dry and almost burny as a lot of meads I've had, which I really appreciate. It really comes off like a red wine that's got kind of like a fruit base to it, to me anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, a lot of my meads I feel like are, are good gateways to, for dry wine drinkers to, to come on over to mead where it's not excessively sweet. Mm -hmm. um, even like when I'm making meat, I'm only using spring water, so I'll just use ice mountain spring waters because I don't want the sodium fluoride or the chlorine or anything in there yeah. because that's designed to kill microorganisms and, and things like that. And so that right there is another, you know, variable I'm eliminating, you know. Um, I'm just using the same source spring water from the grocery store, and if something were to happen and the batch were to go bad, I'd write them a letter, you know. But so what's in this mead? What are we tasting? I mean, I know what I'm tasting, yeah, but what's so what actually we're tasting, making it? Um, I mean, we're tasting, uh, you know, generally when I do a five-gallon batch or something like this, I mean, I'm using two gallons of honey, um, very strong yeast called EC1118. Um, I'll add some uh, black currant juice to it. And then when it comes to Superberry, Superberry 2.0 and 2.5, it can go from 12.5 pounds of fruit up to 20 pounds. And there's a 3.0, but they don't make a fermenter big enough. So, like, basically, I like to do, you know, in the 7.9 gallon bucket. That can accommodate 20 pounds of fruit with the 2 gallons of honey and everything else. And it leaves about a half an inch of head space. Yeah. You know, so if I were to add, like, an extra 5 pounds, which would make the 3.0 version... Um, there just wouldn't be enough room. The one time I made me from a Kurt stock recipe, I bought the 10 gallon bucket. Oh, which uh, I don't know if people have or haven't seen it yet. Cause I don't know if it has or hasn't come out yet, but it's also what I fermented my heat wave Saison in. Are you talking about like the, the, the white they look, garbage can? They, they look like yeah. clearish whitish yeah. gray. I mean, I use that too, but like the main thing is, is like, Generally, wintertime in the Midwest is great for making mead because your basement is right at the optimum temperature, which is the low 60s. Yeah, and talk about like, that. Yeah, fermentation temperature is huge when it comes to these things. And you always, whenever you're doing, you know, like white wines or piments or meads or ciders or anything like that, you basically want to be in the low 60s, um, you know. 
whatever you're fermenting at, you know, temperature wise, you got to figure the ambient temperature, you know, plus when it's actively fermenting, it's always going to be five to seven degrees hotter on the inside. So I want to account for that and always make sure I'm below 70. Once you start going over 70 degrees, you're creating hotter, harsher, fusel alcohol, you know, if you read on the internet about you'll making, taste, but you'll also feel. Yeah, I mean, you're they're they're talking about fermenting at seventy two and higher, and then aging it for two years. You know, <laughs> when I first met this <laughs> lady who was like, "Oh, you know, no. I'll just make a batch of meat and let it sit in the carboy for two years." <clears> That's like, the two. infamousness, the infamity, yeah. whatever the hell, the notoriousness of. I can't say a real word at this point. Thanks, mead. No um, yeah, people don't get into mead. Because they feel like they won't be able to enjoy it for three or four years. And on Brewing TV, when we did that episode with Kurt Stock, it's all about maximum alcohol, peak fruit flavors, clean fermentation, and done in a short amount of time. Yeah. I mean, staggered two, yeast nutrient yeah. addition once again. Two to four months, it's done. Yeah. I mean, depending on the variety or, or what it is I'm doing. But yeah, I mean, that's, I don't have time. <laughs> to wait that I long time. No one ain't got time for that. <laughs> exactly. Got time I, for there, that. I was like two years in the carboy, especially when you first start mm -hmm. making. But well, red wine making has taught me to be a patient person. You know, red wine is the patient person's game. You know, and that taught because it ferments that, soon, but the other <laughs> things that come with the aging. Yes, exactly. But like for me, you know, three four months. I mean, it needs to be amazing, and all I'm trying to do is. When you age things out too much, then you're losing all of that peak fruit flavors, you know. So when I when I teach a meat class or something like that, I'm always touting maximum alcohol, 18 to 20 percent, peak fruit flavors, you know. Because why am I putting all this fruit in there and then age it out when I'm not, you know. Why am I going to spend like 200 raisins. bucks on frozen fruit <laughs> exactly. if when it comes out, all it tastes like is... Raisins and plums, and I'm, I'm just not down with anything stale or soggy. I mean, you know, you get some of these meats that have been aged for five or six years. It's pretty much we could just cut out a piece of cardboard and suck on it, and then yeah. drink some dry, nasty wine, and that's basically what you have there. So in your face, mead makers yeah, so from the '70s. All about <laughs> yeah, it's 2014. Better techniques, better ingredients. All right, let's move on. This is epic tasting notes with me, no choy. All right, ice wine. I brought out the pretty glasses for this yes, one. Yes, yes, yes. We'll open it up. Oh, oh. open it. Let me, yes, Doctor no Choi, yes, tell people about ice wine in general and where the juice came from because okay, it's kind so of a this, saga. Yeah, ice wine. Oh. Yeah, to be a true. <laughs> The, to Mine. be a true ice wine, uh, the grapes need to be frozen on the vine and pressed frozen. So once you have a small wine grape, which is about the size of a large pea, um, I mean, depending on the variety, once that's frozen, when you're locking up the water and they press it, basically all that's coming out is a tiny amount of acid and sugar. You know, because once you lock up that water and, um, I mean, you're getting a very concentrated almost syrup like uh, juice that's coming out of there and uh, ice wine is that comes from Canada basically a lot of it comes from Canada in Wisconsin we can grow the St. Pepin variety um, that is pretty good for ice wine but uh, this is a Vidal Blanc juice um, comes from Canada and it's VQA certified by the Canadian government so it has they, they monitor that you know that it has been legit Frozen on the vine, pressed frozen, and that's what it's all about. Because uh, you notice when you open the ice wine, Charlie like came up <laughs> exactly. out of a dead sleep from exactly. the the story above us. Come on, dude, bring it. The camera's on. Bring it. Come on, bring it. Come on. What is happening? Come on, bro. Don't half step. Come on. Wow, look at this. So I was always under the impression because like an ice bock, which is a bock that's been kind of freeze distilled to some degree. I always thought an ice wine was a wine you make, then you freeze it and you run off. But it's actually a reference to the grape process, not yes. the fermentation or the packaging process. Yeah, I mean, generally, like if you order some ice wine juice or something like that, I mean, you're, you're looking 90 bucks a gallon of unfermented, unfermented juices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, what it is is, first of all, Mother Nature doesn't always allow for this type of thing to happen. Um, you know, 
when you're running a vineyard, a, you need a late maturing variety, and this is Vidal Blanc, which is a late maturing variety with a thicker skin. Then, I mean, besides the bugs that you have to combat, generally you'll net them, which is a very labor intensive process. And a lot of vineyards have propane cannons and things firing off because birds, you know, in the late fall, getting towards winter, they're like, oh my god, there's grapes there. So you lose a bunch to rot, you lose a bunch to the birds bugs and everything else that happens so generally like from my experience it takes about 900 pounds of grapes to get you about five gallons of juice what you know? so yeah this is delicious i get a very like a concentrated white grape flavor um tropical fruity notes uh i was actually there at the mash out and i brought some of this um and we were doing some sampling and uh, the yeast that I was using was a uh, Vin 13, which is from Anchor out of South Africa, and it's one of the new style yeasts that produces a lot of tropical fruit flavors. Well, this was cold fermented <laughs> at 55 degrees. Um, at my buddy Mike Chaltry's house in River West <laughs> in somewhat of a dingy basement, but um, I won the Indy International with this and got a perfect 20 out of 20. Uh, that's this double gold medal right here, and we received the Lalaman Crystal Trophy. We beat out 511 other wines to to win it all. So 20 out of 20. Tell me about hearing that, or were you there to see it, or did no, you literally I, I get a there. sheet in I the mean, mail? I, like, I got a sheet in the mail, you know, and basically when I saw there wasn't a whole lot of comments. Um, it was just numbers, <laughs> numbers, you know, like, it was just numbers. 20 out of 20. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 20 out of 20. So, I mean, this... Have you ever gotten a 50 out of 50 on I, the mead or did, beer side? I did get a 50 out of 50 for the very first mead I ever made. Um, it was an orange <laughs> test. No, yeah. I mean, the very first contest I ever entered, I got a 50 out of 50. Perfect score. In your um, face. Who gave it to you? Was it Al Boys? Al Boys. Al Boys. Al Boys. Boys. Al Boys. And it was an orange <laughs> zest vanilla bean mead. And um, wow. after that, I went... Probably 40 straight contests, just meddling before I finally got skunked. Well, it's been an epic gold medal flight. Um, just kind of any suggestions for somebody. I don't, I don't even want to like say beginner, intermediate, advanced. Just more about the method, more about the confidence that you've kind of talked yeah, about I mean, a couple of times. A, yeah, I mean, when you have the confidence to do it, then the thought that it's not going to turn out never even crosses my mind. I mean... If I'm going to make something, even if it's something I've never made before, it's going to be awesome. You know, that's, I'm going to make it to its best of, you know, its ability and its maximum potential. That's what I'm all about, is making things to its maximum potential. Like, wine is pretty much only as good as the quality of the juice that you're using. Um, when I'm making meads, I use, try to use top quality ingredients. I mean, I always figure with any of this stuff... Good in, good out. I'm going to be the one drinking it, or I'm going to serve it to my parents. When you're the one that's going to be consuming it, I mean, don't cut corners on that. I mean, the basic raw materials, plus developing method, you know, like that's, that's it. I mean, like the method for making these things, you know, which will give you predictable results, then you can have the confidence to do anything. Home brewing in general, like it shouldn't be annoying or get on your nerves or cause you stress or anything like that i mean people get worked up about stuff and for me you know when it gets to that point where it's like i'm tripping about this or that then i'm done you know I mean, this is not even like work to me don't you know, like get this. annoyed yes. don't get annoyed i mean that that is basically have a grandfather who was an epic distiller in korea yeah i mean so that <laughs> It works out like that. We didn't even know. tell that story. Maybe we'll tell it later. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just kind of in my family blood to make these things. Um, my great-grandfather was a giant distiller in Pyongyang before the Korean War broke out, and he ran down to the south and set up shop. So he basically made the 190-proof ethanol that he would sell to all the soju companies. And uh, my grandfather sold essences for flavoring wines. Um, it skipped a generation. I mean, my mom was a fashion designer. She but makes kimchi. <laughs> Yeah, she can make kimchi. But then um, Juno, I mean, worked for NB for 10 years after college, and now he's with BSG. And uh, His brother is an equally amazing dude and fermenter named Juno who we're going to team up with and do some stuff a little bit later this spring. 
yeah, I mean, basically he was like, come on down and just try making something. And then after that, you know, so I got to give props to my brother, you know, I mean, these amazing career opportunities and all these medals and, and I owe it all to him, you know, because he, he made the call. He was like, come on down and just try making something, you know, yeah. and I wasn't beer or wine guy. And so I picked mead and, and the rest is history. So, you know. So Mino brought home some hardware for Chop and Brew. If you bring home some hardware, let us know. Uh, anybody that medals in a competition, we're going to send a t-shirt. Yes. And some Chop stickers. And brew t-shirt. To you. Um, that's not to say if you medal four times in one competition, we'll send you four shirts and four stickers, but we will acknowledge you. I want that to be an incentive for people to, and I don't, I'm not a competition brewer. I don't particularly enter a lot of competitions, but if people do and they don't have anyone else to claim, claim Chop and Brew, I want to give an incentive for people that are figuring out perfection on a certain level for classical styles and understandable styles. So you let us know if you win, send us the PDF of the metal listings and we'll hook you up, foe. Don't forget to send your shirt size or I'm sending you a medium. <laughs> A home brewer's extra small. <laughs> that would be an extra small, dude. For yeah, somebody once told like me like skin tight. They're like, oh, an extra large. You mean a home brewer's medium? I was like, yeah, man. So we got shirts. We do have stickers online. Period. You can buy them or you can earn them by scoring a twenty out of twenty or a fifty out of fifty or just something close and getting acknowledged at a local. Wins are wins. Wins are wins. Wins are wins. Wins are wins. wins. That's. Chip Walden doesn't care. That's what it's all about. <laughs> you know, like, Chip Walden doesn't know. send his beer <laughs> elsewhere. We're <laughs> drinking it. All right, Mina, we're about to get off the rails. There's plenty of these two left to drink. So, yes. until you win your competition or just learn something from Mino and work that into your next fermentation, I would like to say chop for chop. Brew for brew. Charlie P. the Beagle, too. What's the ordinal position in which we want to try these things? I, I don't know, man. Let me brush my beard out for you. <laughs> Let me brush my beard out, man. It's starting to get nice. Well, you can, I can hear the epic static clean coming off the kink. So the way it always works out, we do an intro to kind of set up what's about to happen. <clears throat> and then we roll like a credit board and then we come out and I mean, you've seen an episode. Yeah. Hopefully no one else has. Um, <laughs> what's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I'm Chip Walton, joined by the one and only... You know what you're Alright, I'm gonna say that <laughs> and I'm gonna toss it right to you. <laughs> That's the way it goes. It's always better the second time. I'll wait till you're done drinking that water. We're drinking water! <coughs> Hello everybody, welcome. And you can look at the lens when you're talking to the people. I know it's kind of distracting. You can probably see that screen, but try not I'm to look at it. Because then it looks out. like... <laughs> what was off to the side? <laughs> there was a lady so off to the side. The right. Me knows the champion <laughs> of the brew house. Do doom 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 doom, and he'll keep on fermenting till the end. <laughs> bow bow bow. <laughs> Me knows the champion. Wine, hard cider, and meat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say a real word at this point. Thanks, Mead. <laughs>